Okay, so we're recording. So this afternoon, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Paul Palmer, who some of you will know already. Um, and uh, Paul's going to talk about sugaring for moths. So over to you, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted so many people are interested in uh, sugaring. Um, there was something that I was introduced to as a, um, as a kid. Um, I must have just moved in uh, entomological circles. And when I uh, agreed to do this talk, I thought, oh, I better do some research on uh, sugaring. Um, you know, just find out what previous literature was. And one of the things I came across was a um, wonderful description of the invention of sugaring in the 19th century. And, you know, when I was looking at it, I thought, well, I can't do any better than this. So I've decided to do this talk kind of Blue Peter style. I've got lots of bits just uh, off screen, which I'll show you uh, later. But I'm going to start off by reading some excerpts from uh, a paper by a guy called Ronald Wilkinson of University College London, who um, published a, a paper on the, the history of sugaring. And what was particularly pertinent about this, it looks like uh, sugaring as we know it was invented somewhere between 1815 and 1830. So we're about at the 200th anniversary of sugaring. And the paper, the excerpts from the paper show that a lot of people at the time in the 19th century were fascinated by what sugaring could do for, for moth collectors. And in many ways, we've, we've reached a similar place now that I get the impression a lot of people haven't actually been as lucky as I have to have come across sugaring and want to know a bit more about it. And maybe so many people are being interested today actually confirms that. So hopefully um, this will be of interest to you. And I'm gonna briefly hold this up. I read do everything electronically. So this is about the invention of uh, sugaring in the uh, 19th century. If you do a quick search on Google, you will be able to find this paper. And maybe at the end, we can give some links to the paper. I'm not gonna read the whole lot out verbatim because that would be really boring. I, I've highlighted lots of interesting bits and I'm going to read those out to you and uh, just give um, a little bit of extra annotation on the way. So if you're sitting comfortably, I shall begin. The discovery of additional material in publications of the early 19th century has made desirable a summary of what we know about the development of sugaring. It is certain that the practice as we know it began in Victorian England, but we must look to, to a somewhat earlier date for the circumstances which sent collectors to the forest paths with molasses pail and brush. By the way, um, molasses is um, what we would call black treacle. Um, this was published in an American journal, so he would have used molasses rather than black treacle. If it had been published in an English journal, I'm sure he would have said treacle. Anyway, it's uh, um, um, Alan suggests, uh, this is uh, an author in 1965, suggested the early, earliest observation of the attraction of sweets for moths and the value of this as a means of capturing nocturnal species was made in 1831. Yet it seems that earlier notices may be found. The standard textbook in the period directly preceding the advent of sugaring, Kirby and Spence's Introduction to Entomology, uh, which was published in 1815, mentions the feeding habits more, more than once. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, noted that the, uh, yeah, and every, every serious collector was familiar with this work. Samel um, in 1826 noted that the most successful places for mothing are the skirts of woods under the wind, where there is an abundance of plants in blossom, as it is the nectar of flowers on which they feed. Uh, now I'm going to just dip out at a moment. I don't know how many of you have actually wandered around the, uh, the woods at night with only a, a dim light. But if you do, um, you will find that moths don't fly around in the zigzagged haphazard way they do around the light trap. They actually 
most of them hover like hummingbirds and they visit um, flowers. Um, it, it's really quite quite fascinating um, watching them. Um, and anyway, we will dip into that in a bit more. So it's clear that these entomologists were quite used to going out at night looking for the moths while they were feeding on flowers. Perhaps such observations led Abel Lingpen to suggest the first artificial bait. In a previously unnoticed passage in his instructions for collecting, rearing and preserving British insects, he hinted that sheets of paper smeared with honey water, beer and sugar or, or sugar sprinkled over them would answer the purpose of attracting insects. So there we, we have it, the very, very first um, reference to artificial bait in what we would call um, uh, sugaring. And then um, as time goes on, um, in 1831, uh, John Walton, uh, uh, when collecting with his two friends, noted that moths were attracted in swarms to the ripe berries of the yew. Uh, when the entomologists turned, returned to London, they provided themselves with bullseye lanterns, forceps, etc., and sallied forth to take advantage of the discovery. Um, th these for forceps were an early form of uh, like scissor nets, so they're like they had little rings on the end with gauze, and they, they would use those to catch the moths. <clears throat> now, armed with the forceps, an early form of net much resembling a large pair of scissors with gauze covered rings attached to the points, they took numerous rare species on the local ewes. Walton continued to visit these trees each autumn. In 1833, he took over 2,000 moths at the fruits and noted a fact that was to assume great importance when the technique of artificial bait was fully developed. He was more generally successful in capturing the rarer species when the nights were warm and rainy. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit aghast at him taking 2,000 moths. That was, that's rather, um, rather a lot for, for, for anyone. But I do think when we read these texts as well, we do get the impression that there were far more moths on the wing than we habitually see today, which is, is sad, uh, but true. But this comment about that when the nights were warm and rainy, we shall come back to. Now, um, uh, we, we move on um, uh, uh, a little bit uh, to a, um, uh, another note where people had suggested you know, the use of sugar. And this guy, Edward, advised collectors to lay a sugar's hog, hog's head, which had just been emptied, and to which, of course, some small quantity of sugar will still adhere, in an open place near a garden or field. After a few nights, it would be frequented by numbers of noctua, among which would not unfrequently be found some of the rarer species. The moths would continue to visit the bower, particularly on moist evenings, as long as it retains any saccharine matter. So here we have the origin of sugaring, that the very first guys, and uh, presumably ladies as well, were using hogsheads of sugar. Now I'm just going to share the screen briefly, because just to um, get, uh, and here we have, uh, hopefully you can see that, uh, it's a, um, an open commons picture. We're talking about these hogsheads, which are these great big barrels. Um, they, they look to me to be four or five feet across. So we're not talking about... Um, Paul, can you, uh, can, you, can you put the actual photo up? It's, it's a bit okay, strong. Okay, new share. Uh, yes, try. If you open the photo, that's the one. That's the one, okay, gotcha. Just remind me to do that. So you can see what a hogshead is. What I wasn't prepared for was just how big these things were. So what we were talking about here is lugging one of these huge barrels into the edge of your garden or a field um, with the top off and then looking for the moths that were attack attracted to the sugar inside. I'm gonna stop the share um, uh, now. Uh, uh, and then uh, East India sugar bags have also been employed for the same purpose with very great success and on these the moss may be captured with far greater uh, facility than on a sugar hogshead which from its shape is less accessible. So there we are have it the first um, 
uh, you know, at first people were using these great big hogsheads and then they worked out that actually the smaller sacking sugar bags were, were just as, um, uh, as good. And then uh, we move on quite quickly. As cumbrous as these sugaring methods of the 1830s seem to have been, much experimental data were obtained from them, which led to the introduction in 1841 of our pre present practice of painting the, tree, the trunks of trees with various sugar mixtures. Um, and then uh, take, uh, here we've got one dated 1841, explains that by taking some sugar and water and brushing it onto the trunks of trees or sprinkling it on the bushes, we attract immense numbers of moths. And about an hour after sunset, they remain quite, uh, quite quiet. And with a light, you can select what you want. So there we are. By, by 1841, people were actually using uh, a sugar and um, uh, water mixture. Uh, just have a look. Um, uh, and now what, what of the ingredients people are using? Uh, here we are. Uh, Douglas claimed that the saccharine system of taking moss proved successful and he had painted the posts in his garden every possible night and the moths came in droves. Strong sugar was suggested and another step was taken towards a modern mixture. Treacle, I find, does equally well. So this is what the Americans call molasses, we call treacle. So here we have in 1841, somebody was going around, um, Douglas was going around, dobbing black treacle on uh, a um, on, on trees and, uh, and we also have a Hammersmith collector referring to Catacola fraxini, the blue underwing um, on the trunk of an apple tree um, using uh, sugar and getting uh, nuptar, um, the red underwing, very frequently. Um, Doubleday listed his numerous captures at Epping during the autumn of 1842 but it would seem that the exact nature of the mixture was revealed only to a small circle of friends. So here we have conspiracy in entomological circles, great secrets. The, uh, the mixture was revealed only to a small circle of friends. The dealer, uh, Harding, reminisced that there was a great desire among working entomologists to know how it was made, but the secret was retained by a few. All kinds of scent were tried. Uh, but were not much juice. A man of the name of Courtney made some up and sold it and won at one shilling and sixpence per pint, a large sum in the mid 19th century. So we even have exploitation of secret recipes of moss sugar. I mean, it's, uh, as you say, it's really exciting stuff, this. I find it so, which is why I couldn't possibly have written anything better uh, than this. And uh, uh, here, here we have um, a few notes. So by 1843, so many collectors had heard about the success of painting trees, there was a general demand for more details. Um, and uh, Douglas uh, noted, uh, there was not generally, uh, it, the use of sugar was not generally understood by country entomologists. I'm sorry for hesitating, but I'm re rewording some of this just so it flows a little better on the line. And Douglas's explanation must be quoted in full because it shows what yes, what the uh, sugar water or treacle method had become by, by 1843. And here's your very first recipe. The strongest brown sugar, known as Jamaica Foots, is mixed with hot water to the consistency of treacle or somewhat thinner and, in a, sm and a small portion of rum added and stirred in. The composition is then laid on the trunks of trees in favourable situations with a painter's brush. I have found it is better to make long, narrow streaks than broad patches. The sugar should be put on the trees at dusk before the moths fly, for I have repeatedly observed that if used afterwards, there will not be nearly so many come. With a lantern suspended from the neck, and thereby preserving an upright position during every movement, the collector may visit the trees several times during an evening. The greater number of moths will be found in the first hour, but some species are only taken late at night. Some persons boil the sugar and water, and I think it's an advantage, but I have not yet tried it. 
of the efficacy of, uh, of the rum, I'm sure, having more than once seen one collector use it and another at the same time sugar without it, when the former would uh, obtain double the number of noctuary. So it's mainly noctuids that come. Now, I'll just dive out. <laughs> Here is some sugar that probably is what they were calling Jamaica foot. So this is raw uh, muscovado cane sugar. It's completely unlike the things like the free trade brown sugar. And if I open it mm, and taste a bit, the flavor and strength of the flavor is incredible. It's, it's an amazing aroma comes from this. So here's the first little thing that they're saying, that the ingredients that you use really matter. And oh, I've got the most amazing sweet taste in my um, uh, mouth, mouth there from, from that, uh, that sugar. Um, uh, it's got an incredible aroma. Um, and I suspect, and it go, goes on here to say, um, uh, that uh, some of the problems people have with it not working is that basically they're not using the same aromatic ingredients. And here we have a nice example from the paper. The Reverend Bree in 1844 was one of those who found sugar to be of little value, but it is no wonder, as his paper suggests he visited the trees only after the sun up. And uh, Gregson conducted a comparative test between fine white sugar and some from the lower side of a West India hogshead. It was very dark brown and smelled very strong of rum. He concluded the reason that so many have, succeed, have not succeeded has been that they have used sugar without any smell. Uh, Gregson also called attention uh, once more to warm moist nights as the best for sugaring, recommending misly rain is best beneficial. I have no idea what misly rain is, um, uh, but there, there you go. But just to stay on this point um, a, a, a little bit, I have seen a, a popular wildlife program actually try a little bit of sugaring, and they compared the results of sugaring in against the moth trap, and they visited the sugar in the morning and the moth trap in the morning. And I, I think even today there is a little bit of confusion um, about uh, how you, you sugar, which is why I really wanted to, to read out from these, these old texts, because I think in the 19th century, people were equally uh, com confused and bemused about how to, um, uh, uh, to do this. And um, uh, the next thing I, I hope will make you smile, because it's always made me smile. So by 1894, uh, collectors using sugaring were really numerous, uh, so that the card method was used. He describes it, um, this is Ferno describing it, he describes it in Butterflies and Moss. I have sometimes seen cards bearing the names of the collectors and their date of working tacked on to the baited trees and fences, thus establishing their temporary exclusive right to the use of their runs. Ferno cautioned that each entomologist has a moral right to a run he has debated, and it is considered ungentlemanly, if not unjust, to take insects from sugar laid by another. I well remember as a youth mixing my first pot of bait according to Ferno's old directions, uh, that odour rather than purity is to be the guide, the smell is important again, uh, and shuddering in anticipation and reading that if there is such a person as a nervous entomologist, that individual should on no account go a-sugaring in lonely spots on dark nights. And that bit of English advice was just as applicable in American forests in the early 1940s. So I guess I've been raised, I've wandered around the woods at night, but I have to say it can be very spooky wandering around um, at night and certainly at Rutland Water where I often go, voices will, will travel, um, uh, will travel a long way in that air. So you, you, can, you can hear a voice thinking, gosh, there's somebody here, only to realize they're a long, long way away. Very, very spooky. Um, oh, I got a, a misly rain is a good northern word. It just soaks you through and um, not quite miss, not quite drizzle, mizzle. I love it. Thank you guys. Thank you so much um, for that.
And I've got just a little bit more before I, um, I go on. Let me get out of this page, get out here, get out here, and um, uh, sugaring in the um, autumn. So I'm going to read to you now um, uh, a recipe for, for sugar. This one dates from um, the 1950s. Uh, oh, no, no, 1905. That's it. This one dates from about 1905 and is actually quite similar to the recipe um, that I use. And um, uh, basically, the article is, is one called Sugaring in Autumn. I'll hold it up a moment. I'm not going to read the a whole lot out. But in, uh, in America, at first, there was some thought that sugaring didn't work very well over there until people, just like over here, figured out how to do it. But anyway, this was the, um, uh, the sugar recipe in the, the Little Moth book. Four pounds of sugar. And again, I'm presuming we need, we need raw cane sugar here. One bottle of stale beer and a little rum to be placed in a bucket and applied uh, to trees with a whitewash brush. That seems an extraordinary amount um, uh, to me. Now, the, uh, the formula that was uh, given to the author um, by uh, Mr. Reef, uh, a German guy, is one quart of cheapest molasses to which add about one half a bottle of stale beer and then boil it until it nearly stiffens when dropped in cold water. Let it cool and add about uh, a wine glass of uh, Jamaica rum. This mixture should be prepared some days in advance as aging seems to improve it. And this sugar is just enough for three trips and gives each time enough for 40 to 50 trees. Okay, so um, I've, I've finished reading and I'm going to do some more blue tip pizza bits, but there you are, um, an idea for how many patches of sugar these guys were putting out, uh, about uh, 40 to 50. These days, I, I would aim to double it, to, to be honest. You, you really need to get about 100 patches out there to get make, make it, it worthwhile. But um, uh, I'll put up a recipe in a minute. So uh, what are the ingredients we're talking about? Well, oh, before I go, one more thing. I, 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 I nearly, nearly forgot my, um, my notes here. There is just one time when you might try sugaring during the day. So you're an entomologist and you live above the Arctic Circle. So uh, light traps aren't going to be much use. And I came across this in a presentation at the bird watching fair. And that was the Aulu trap. What that is, is a great big trap you hang on a tree and you put your sugar in a container in the trap and you have some little funnels. So the idea is that your moths get in the, in the, are attracted to the scent and um, uh, you leave the, these traps up for a week or so and you use them in conjunction with the insecticide. I've never tried that but I've left them overnight. I've never caught anything but large yellow underwings, but uh, large yellow underwings aren't fussy. You put some sugar out, you put one of these traps out and you'll catch alone. So I made 10 of these traps. I never used them though, but it was great, great fun. And that's, uh, I had to make these li little funnels to make it work. So that's the only time that you might go sugaring during the day, but it's a possible cause of, um, cons uh, confusion where some people have got the idea about sugaring in the day and it's where people are using these baited baited traps but um, moving on now uh, going on to the um, uh, ingredients I've already shown you the um, uh, muscovado sugar and you know this you, what you want is the raw cane sugar the supermarkets sometimes sell it but not always um, and then you need black treacle. Um, uh, black treacle always has a, I don't know if you can read it, a, a dispose of before expiry label. And that is because sometimes it ferments a bit in the can. And if it, that's happened, you get plastered in black treacle when you take the lid off. I don't think it's a danger to life or limb, but it would make a hell of a mess. 
And then of course you need, um, there's some of the recipes say wine and some say ale. So I put both in. So I use uh, some cheap red wine, you know, the red mulled wine might do. I also use strong beer. I, um, I do a lot of cooking. And if I'm making um, a sort of a beef and ale stew, I would use something like black sheep ale. So I would add both of those to the moth sugar. And um, obviously you can't do without rum as um, well. And the two together make just over uh, a liter and a half of um, treacle when, when cooked together. Now, if I take the lid off, oh, the smell from that is absolutely incredible. When, uh, oh, and to actually put it on the trees, <laughs> I make my sugar up and I spray it on. So I put some disposable gloves on and I spray it on the tree. I'm just going to be giving myself a little bit of space here so I can show you a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, get all these ingredients out of the, um, of the way. So by the way, we're talking here about only spraying the finest edible ingredients out in the countryside. Because I figure if you're going to um, uh, spray something around on a nature reserve, there's no chance of anybody or anything poisoning itself with it. Um, it's, it's only the very finest ingredients. And somebody says, but where would you buy the Moscovado sugar? Um, you used to be able to get it in Sainsbury's. Uh, Billington's, um, uh, one particular make, would sell it in sissy little packets. Um, I now find you can get it on the internet. In fact, I buy, we buy, Leslie and I buy a lot of our cooking ingredients on the internet. Um, because we found that, uh, you know, because of the COVID crisis, the range of fine cooking ingredients went down. I've got this from somewhere called spicesontheweb.co.uk. And it was um, really a very, very good, good value. Um, now I'd be certainly buying other cooking ingredients from these people as um, well. So if you were to do a search for spices on the web, um, uh, absolutely yummy looking uh, uh, website. So I'm now going to share a screen again. Um, so uh, first thing, uh, can you see, uh, uh, can, can, can you see the um, this spray going on? No, we can't see it. Is it a video? Uh, no, it's... A picture. Yeah, well, we can, we've can. we got the thumbnail. Can you put the big picture up? And that's what I'm trying to do. Yes, stop. Share. If you open, open the picture first and then share that window. Uh, yeah, I've got it open now. Share screen. Oh, here we go. Uh, share. Can you see it now? Okay. Yeah, so there, there, you, there you go. Um, that's sort of spraying it on a, on a, a, a post. My mixture is quite thin. After the first bit of rain you have, it's, you can hardly see it. But I'm, I'm a bit careful about where I spray it so I don't disfigure um, uh, stuff. And I, I also try to avoid spraying it on any lichens that might look rather rare. I'm useless at lichens, but I don't want to get chased. And um, I'm going to now share something else, the recipe, and I'll leave um, that up a moment and I can get back to uh, there. Here we go. Right, I uh, got that open. Here we go. Share. So uh, hopefully you can see the uh, see the recipe um, there. So um, for my batches of sugar, I put in 500 grams of the Muscovado sugar, uh, 500 grams of black treacle, that's one tin. Yeah, the tin has got 454, so it's one tin of black um, treacle, half a litre of ale, and um, it's uh, 75, uh, 0.75 a litre of my um, uh, cheap red wine. I love this red wine in cooking. I've never actually tasted it actually, but it's great in cooking. And then um, the other thing I do sometimes is um, uh, I'll also, I'm going to stop the share. What I also do is for a baited trap, 
you can see in here, hopefully there's bits. And what that is, it's dried fruit. So I've marinated dried fruit with um, the sugar mixture. And that is what I tried using in the aloe traps. Um, I've also seen people um, kind of make mix this up a bit thicker and then kind of smear it on trees. So if you cook the mixture up to a more treacly consistency, um, uh, and then added um, the, the fruit, that would work uh, quite well. And what I also do as well, I, I use this as an ingredient in things like Christmas puddings and uh, ginger cake, uh, because uh, that is, uh, the flavour is hugely in, enhanced by this sort of mixture. But it's another reason for only using the very finest quality um, ingredients. Now, the, uh, I read out to you that uh, they recommended bullseye lanterns. Well, these days, of course, you'd use a head torch. They would have, the Victorians would have loved USB rechargeable head torches. So, um, yep, I've been going out, um, uh, putting out about 100 patches. I've never had more than 20 or 30 moths. I've had some disastrous nights. I've had some great nights. I've not caught anything rare yet. I'd love to catch a, um, well, I did catch a square spotted clay. So, yeah, that's a notable species. Uh, at sugar. Uh, Svensson's uh, copper underwing. Copper underwings come in vast numbers uh, to sugar. Uh, they're little ninja warriors though. They, um, if you try to stun them with CO2, they, I swear they hold their breath and then leap into action uh, so you can't check their underwings. Um, I'd love to get the blue underwing but not had that um, yet. Uh, but overall, because I've been a bit short of time, I have found wandering around sugaring to be absolutely fantastic because there's no noise of the generator. It's also wonderfully lightweight. You go out there, you sugar at dusk, and then you patrol the, um, the patches until you, you get fed up, 11 o'clock, midnight, and then you, um, no packing up to do, you hop in your car and you can drive home. And it's so wonderfully peaceful. And as I say, um, as the year's going on a little bit, uh, start to see the moths uh, flying around the natural nectar patches as well, which is something that you don't always do. So it's a, um, a, a wonderful experience. And if you don't want to go through all of this trouble, as a kid, I would buy some um, black treacle, steal some of my parents' um, rum, mix that in with the black treacle. I I like to think they didn't know I was nicking the rum, but they probably did, but thought it was okay. <laughs> and then um, uh, daub just black treacle uh, on, uh, at various places, uh, long, long, long lines of trees. And I, I can recall uh, some evenings having vast numbers of moths, never anything rare. I think the most I ever saw were things like um, yeah, Cetaceous Hebrew characters and literally every patch of sugar you put out a patch of treacle literally shoulder to shoulder with um uh shoulder to shoulder around the um, sugar patches and that's about me wrapping up i've just noticed somebody saying i think the ginger cake deserves another zoom meeting um yes as does the uh, the christmas pudding uh, everybody who's tried it tells me it's wonderful um, uh, uh, but again, uh, lots of research goes into these things. There's so many of these old recipes, there's mistakes in them and they don't work. So it took quite a few bad cakes before I got one of those to work. Right, I think I'm done on the uh, more formal bit of the uh, presentation. You notice that all the, uh, the rum and the, uh, the, uh, the wine and the beer are all remain sealed up, so I'm pretty sober at the moment so <laughs> quite happy to throw it open to any questions now thanks paul that was great um i i've i've been um uh um i i, I need some tips from your recipe um i I've, I've sugared in previous years with you know moderate success as you say never never anything terribly rare um uh i i've, I've had a go over the last couple of weeks 
Um, and um, I have to say the results uh, it just recently have been disappointing. Um, but, you know, we're, we're in the middle of August now. Well, one thing that surprised me this year was um, other years, uh, particularly by the middle of August, uh, the only moths I get shoulder to shoulder um, uh, around um, sugar are old ladies. Um, and this year I've not had a single old lady come to the sugar, which, which is a bit unusual, I think. Mm. Um, I've had uh, old ladies at sugar. I mean, I've got some... Um... Uh, photograph. Um, in fact, they came quite well on one particular night. Uh, I can't remember how many I had, but it was um, numbers of them. None around, um, I was light trapping as well, but none around the light trap, uh, but quite a few around the sugar. I just read a, a note, uh, does it say just mixed together or boiled? Uh, that's the, the ingredients. Um, mix together, heat them. I just bring it to the boil and stop. Um, if you want a thicker mixture to brush on, then you cook it for a little bit longer. Um, but everybody's got their own um, uh, mixture. And uh, uh, overripe bananas, yes, they work brilliantly as well. There, there's, oh, that's, that looks like raspberry jam, isn't it? Fantastic. Well, there, there, there may have been some raspberry jam in there, yes, some red wine. You know, there wasn't yeah. any black treacle in there, I don't think, and no rum, but certainly a bit of alcohol, I think, is a good idea. But yeah, no, um, I, no normally I'm, I'm knee-deep in old ladies. Uh, this year, not so much, but as you can see, they get the proboscis out and they, they really, I think I've counted, you know, 11 or more uh, on, on occasion, but uh, they, they, they're, they're certainly, the copper underwings, as you say, uh, the old ladies are, are frequent. And um, unusually what I've had this year quite a lot is I've had a lot of mouse moths coming to sugar, which is, you know, I don't know, I mean, they come to light as well, but... Uh, the the, uh, the mouse moth like um, uh, sugar obviously they're related to the copper underwings and uh, uh, where the uh, you know the copper underwings are like super warriors the um, uh, the mouse moths just zip around they're definitely super fast troops um, but you can identify those quite easily I've had quite a few herald moth at um, sugar as well they they just can't keep the proboscis out of it either. Um, now, uh, um, I mean, obviously the, uh, the red underwings, um, uh, generally, uh, absolutely love the stuff. Um, I've always found that I've gotten red underwings more frequently in traps when I've been near like an apple tree or something, because the red underwings will feed on the fallen apples and then they will come weekly, um, to, to light. So I don't know if anybody's ever tried any sort of combined stuff. By the way, you know, some of the early entomologists used to um, warm those hogshead barrels, which struck me as being a terribly risky thing to do and involved um, a, probably a, a lot of flame. I've tried warming the sugar with these little hotty hand warmers as well. And uh, that works quite well. Um, it definitely worked. Um, uh, I definitely got more to the warm sugar. Um, somebody got here, no, uh, Jonathan, overripe bananas in? Very definitely. I've seen people do that. Makes a very thick, thick mixture. But overripe bananas by themselves will work. But mixed with the sugar, uh, I'll tell you what, though, I'd need a different sort of spray gun to spray a mixture with the bananas in. So, well, um Mark Skellington does a trick. If he has a banana that's sat too long in his fruit bowl, um, what, what he'll do, is, and nobody wants to eat it anymore, um, what do you, uh, and you're going to tell me now this makes very good banana cake, which it does, but um, what, what, it, what he'll do is take it and um, cut a window in the peel. Uh, if, you just, uh, if you peel the whole banana, within, within an, a day or so, it turns complete mush but he cuts a window and then either wedges it in the fork of a tree or hangs it with cotton from a tree. And then you'll get a week or so as the banana gradually liquefies. Um, so um, it, it's an easy thing to do. There's no cooking as such, but yeah, it certainly attracts moths. Mm, yeah, uh, there was a, a, a technique. I, um, I came across some papers. I couldn't find them uh, for some reason again. Uh, there are some techniques that they, they did in the 19th century or early 20th century where they used um, 
uh, stocking. So they put things like the fruit and treacle mix into a stocking and hang that up and keep that topped up. Make perhaps put like a tin at the top with a little grip and then they make like semi-permanent runs that they visit week after week. Um, and I've got a note here, is there a better time of year to sugar? Well, um, any time of year where there's natural nectar for the, the moths to, to, to drink. Um, I've always thought that late summer and autumn are better times than spring. But, you know, the, the, um, uh, there are nectar runs in the spring as well, so maybe it, maybe it works. But I personally have always thought autumn is the better time. So we're coming now, for me, what would be the best time um, for sugaring. And the, the other thing is, as well, at this time of year, when, when sunset falls, um, it's also quite, quite convenient because you get the most moths in the first couple of hours of, of sugaring. So, you know, if you're a bit short of time, as I've alluded to, I am at the moment, um, then go out before sunset, a few hours, you know, you, you can be back by midnight, which is, which is really good, um, ha having had really quite a good session. But um, I have to say, I have noticed things like, you know, the, the hawk moths, say, and some of them, they, they definitely don't fly to much later in the night. So there's definitely a time related thing there as, um, as well. Um, and I, I've never stayed all the way through the night sugaring. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if the moths that only come in the morning. Um, do you want to say something about wine ropes, Paul? If people are reading about this, they might come across wine ropes. Uh, yeah, um, I, couldn't, I have got some photos of this. The, the mixture that I've made up, which is quite runny, would be fine for white wine ropes. And what you need is um, some of the best uh, rope. There's the old um, sash rope, which was a cotton rope. Um, if it was wax, just boil it up in water to take the wax out so it would uh, absorb a lot of liquid but the basic idea is to get some ropes I'm waving my hands around a bit now I know and you soak them in the um, this lovely moss sugary mixture and then you hang them on trees and fences um, the different ways of doing it I, I just used to make them quite long and hang them as a loop and maybe just tie them and uh, you know when I only had a bicycle um, uh, I could put a small container with the wine rope mixture and uh, tie that tightly to my bike pannier, cycle out to a nature reserve and then hang all the wine ropes up and then collect them at the uh, end of the evening. So it's again, it's just another way of um, getting the, um, the mixture out there. Um, but you do get a bit sticky and messy. I <laughs> most one of the things to remember that this is really quite sticky and messy solution and um, if you're not careful you end up having to put everything that you've got on through the washer when you get back home hence me eventually adopting the spray method where and uh, gloves because at least i found most of the time i stay reasonably clean and also with this you can spray on bits of vegetation. If you recall, some of the notes that I read out to you referred to dribbling the, the mixture over leaves. Well, the spray is a really good way to do that. The only thing is, is that it gets ever so hard to spot at night and remember where you've sprayed, which is why tree trunks and fence posts are so easy. You, you can find them again in the dark. But, uh, any, anyway, I'll leave you guys to um, have fun. Uh, giving it a go. <laughs> okay, so we got any more any more questions? Is there anything that? Um... No, I, I think that's a great description, Paul. Thank you for sharing your secret recipe. Um, uh, um, uh, I hope that people will have a go. Oh, yeah, Paul, can you just put the recipe up again? There's a request. Can you put I that can. screen up with the recipe again? I, of course I can. I hope people will have a go. And uh, if you're in Leicestershire and Rutland, I hope you'll, you'll share your records on uh, NatureSpot as well. 
So this is Paul's no, no longer secret recipe. Oh, there's nothing uh, secret uh, about it. I've adapted it over um, over the years, um, uh, but it, uh, yeah, uh, the cheap red wine. To say, uh, I found some uh, cheap mulled wine that we hadn't used. Used that one time. Uh, the main thing is is to get a mixture that smells wonderful. Um, and then I found on the good nights when I've laid a load of sugar patches out I can smell them in the uh, in the air uh, so if I can smell them the moths have probably got much better scent receptors than me uh, and hopefully they, they think it smells every every bit as good okay so um, thanks again Paul very much My pleasure. Um, we, we hope everyone will have a go um, and um, uh, we wish you all uh, great success with your moths. So thank, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, thanks to Paul. Thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so we, we hope to see you at some of the future Nature Spot online.